1995, a small computer animation company released a movie about a wooden cowboy child's plaything and Tim the Spaceman Taylor. As the studio began forming its identity, Pixar made a big and somewhat controversial decision musically that sometimes gets overlooked and had an immediate and lasting impact on the franchise. Toy Story was initially helmed musically by this man, Randy Newman, and you can't tell the story of Pixar without talking about him. A known quantity, Newman had already achieved success with his 1977 hit Short People and was coming into his own in 1995 when he was chosen to do Toy Story. Pixar's first four movies were scored by him, and the love affair that people started having with the movies were in no small part due to his whimsical and lyrical music. And as the years go by. Could a movie like this have a lyrical song in it? Sure. You've Got a Friend in Me certainly doesn't feel out of place. Nor did lyrics ruin the moment Buzz Lightyear decided to try and jump out of a window and prove he was more than just a tool man. This seemed to be the Pixar formula. A fun, lighthearted take on a child's concept, weaved throughout with adult themes and emotions. The formula worked. Randy Newman scored Toy Story, Toy Story 2, Bugs Life, and even Monsters, Inc., and they all premiered and they all profited. Then in 2003, something changed. Directors John Lasseter and Pete Docter took a backseat and allowed a new director to take over the next feature by the name of Andrew Stanton. Stanton had helped on the previous films, and now it was a chance for him to direct his own feature. He and producer Lasseter decided to move the music in a different direction, despite the critical success and acclaim of Randy Newman. Stanton already had someone in mind. It was Randy's cousin, Thomas Newman. To be fair, Thomas was also an Oscar-nominated composer who had scored movies already, like Meet Joe Black, American Beauty, and The Shawshank Redemption, just to name a few. Stanton said he actually wrote the story for Finding Nemo. Spoiler alert, that's the movie we're talking about. While listening to some of Thomas Newman's past work, if I ever meet Thomas, I'm going to have a very similar story about my chemistry homework. Not nearly as cool, but still. In fact, it might be fair to say that Stanton never actually considered anyone else, not even Randy. Said Stanton, I couldn't imagine anybody else. His music helped me set the tone on the script. I felt like I was getting an essential cast member. Thomas admitted later that he was nervous about stepping into his cousin's shoes, but his anxiety may have been misplaced. There may have never been a composer whose style matched the content of the film he was scoring better than this. His music has often been characterized by fluid, wispy woodwind solos and liquid strings, so he glided naturally into the ocean that Stanton created. This is the tone Stanton was referring to. This is the musical genius that Thomas was bringing to the Pixar table. Newman effectively transports the audience down into the quiet abyss of the deep blue and manages to capture the vastness, but also the serenity of the ocean where the story is told. There, there, there. It's okay, Daddy's here. Daddy's got you. So what was the result? A score that really works, conveying emotions of loss, sadness, danger, and still the Pixar whimsicality that carries the franchise, and allowed Pixar to go even deeper than it ever had before. The rest, needless to say, is history. Finding Nemo was nominated for Best Original Score, as Thomas Newman was denied ridiculously yet again. He reunited with Stanton to do 2008's Wally, -E, which he relied even more heavily upon Thomas Newman, considering the first half of the movie was nothing more than a trash compactor. As for Pixar, the decision to go with Thomas over Randy may have seemed inconsistent at first, and a risky departure from a proven formula, but it's definitely led to greater success. Pixar has evolved from fun, emotional kids' movies with really touching moments at times to perhaps the greatest film franchise in cinematic history. Change my mind. And that is due in no small part to the music that runs underneath each film. And they've kept that music in the family, so to speak. The third member of the Pixar triumvirate is Michael Giacchino, who they brought in to score The Incredibles and has done others including Inside Out, 
and up. There are two anomalies, The Good Dinosaurs, done by Michael and Jeff Dana, as well as Brave, which was done by Patrick Doyle. Other than that, Randy Newman, Thomas Newman, and Michael Giacchino are the only names that have touched the Pixar musical lexicon. Pretty amazing, considering how tight-knit that group has kept the music, as compared to, say, Marvel or James Bond. So are we giving Thomas Newman and Finding Nemo too much credit? Perhaps. Nevertheless, Finding Nemo, in our eyes, represents a dramatic departure from a successful, lyrical-filled formula to a grander, feeling-filled formula that has produced more for Pixar and for our ears than previously imagined. Thanks for watching this episode of The Blind Mole. If you liked it, be sure to subscribe and check out our other videos on the channel. Also, don't hesitate to comment, ask questions, or propose ideas for future videos.